Welcome to another episode of our podcast series where we discuss uh, top, all topics relevant to entrepreneurship, innovation, and apparel. So today I have with me Kunal Amleen, who is the head of Runway Kit. Um, hi, Kunal. Uh, welcome to the show. Thanks for being with us today. Um, so I'd like to start the conversation with a brief introduction into your journey to becoming the head of uh, Runway Kit. How did that look like? Sure. Uh, so first of all, thank you so much for the invitation and uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, so I think I would start with um, going all the way back to 2008 uh, when I was at Babson College. Um, and uh, I studied entrepreneurship and economics at Babson. Um, so as part of our freshman codes in the first year, we were, we were actually supposed to start our project. Um, so one of our projects was, was in the Apollo um, company that we had to start. So we were, we were selling sweatshirts and boxers across campuses around uh, the Boston area. Um, and I was in charge of operations there. And uh, it was also my job to speak to the, the different sourcing companies in, uh, in Asia and Southeast Asia. And uh, we had to negotiate on the pricing. Uh, one of the biggest uh, pain points that I realized was that they were unable to produce small order quantities of, uh, you know, we just wanted 100, 100 150 pieces. Um, but these suppliers were unable to support us. So, so we spoke to multiple different vendors and uh, we also understand that there were many challenges in how they can get the product um, to, to, support, to support this startup, sort of um, college startup uh, like ours. Um, and um, I kind of, I mean, we, we also worked on that project for about one year. And that whole concept kind of uh, stuck into my mind. Eventually, we, we got in touch with MAs. And at that time, they were also uh, supporting us with some with boxers, right? But even then, back then, for me, um, I didn't have any experience in, in the industry. I didn't understand all the te technical aspects or the products. And that's when I realized after, after graduating from college um, and about three to four years ago, that's when I realized that there was a need, that there was uh, a space where it was something that for a large manufacturer like MAs, we need to uh, tap into the space, right? So back in 2015, 2016, I saw that there was a rise in uh, digital, digital and e-commerce. And um, people were also seeing that uh, large, large established brands, uh, the market share was also it was kind of uh, diluting, right? So that's when I saw that there was a huge opportunity for smaller brands, um, startups and uh, smaller brands to um, get into this space. So I, um, so I felt that uh, there was a need for MAs to understand how, to understand the business model of uh, supporting smaller and emerging brands in the company. So I guess uh, with Runway Kit, we kind of started with the digital platform in connecting with apparel startups with the manufacturers. And we wanted to create a whole user experience uh, for them to, um, because we, un we understand the pain points of what the, what the startup was going through and the pain points that a, ma that a manufacturer was going through when, when engaging with the startup. So we kind of uh, tried to come to a common ground and created this, uh, this digital platform that suits both parties. So um, how does one study entrepreneurship and then apply it um, directly to the industry? Did it help or is it all the experience that you've gathered that, you, um, that has helped more, more in the process? Um, so when I started at Babson, obviously um, I did not have much of experience in learning what entrepreneurship was all about. Right? So college only gave me the fundamentals, uh, the tools, um, and the techniques of what it means to uh, start, start a brand. What are the things that you should be looking out for? Um, how do you craft out your marketing strategy, your financials? How do you work with the team? How do you connect with the, with the suppliers? Um, so I think um, uh, it was not an overnight, uh, overnight thing. Um, over, over the past uh, six to seven years, uh, during my time in MAs, I actually spent uh, about 16 months at the factory uh, at MAs. 
So for me, I think it was like very important to understand the entire value chain of the apparel industry, right? You need to understand the design, uh, the technical product development, sourcing to production, and look at the shipping and logistics as well. So I guess uh, it's like the combination of uh, understanding, okay, understanding a bit deeper into the industry and looking at uh, the whole concept of entrepreneurship and um, uh, and it has given me the, the, the tools to get to where I am today. So Ramvi Kit obviously sounds like a very unique um, combination for MS. What are some of the challenges that you had when you started off? Uh, with Ramvi Kit. With Ramvi Kit. Initially, oh. so one of the initial challenges that we faced was uh, building the conviction, building the consensus across all the stakeholders in the organization because it was something that we, that we had to connect with um, all the divisions, uh, the leadership to the management level, and try to understand what are the pain points that they were facing when they were working with startup brands, right? Um, it took a while, it took quite a bit of time because people were so kind of, um, I, I wouldn't say stuck, but uh, they, they had their own uh, predefined sort of uh, norms uh, in how the structure should be. How does a bigger brand, uh, how, how should a manufacturer support or um, continue supporting with, uh, with, with the big, bigger brands? So it really took a bit of time to uh, get the consensus from everyone. And uh, we also had to find the right team, the right capabilities. Um, so at that time, we had to try to find the right sort of a team that had an expertise in developing a platform, right? Um, and what user interface really means to us, what user experience really means to us. Um, and I, at, at the same time also, we had to visit the manufacturing facilities and connect with the merchants and technicians. Sometimes there were quite a few pushbacks uh, from them as well because it's a very new concept, um, but I had to kind of figure out a way to tell them that, that we are going to the future, right? That we should not be focusing on, on the present. I mean, it's good to focus on the present, but it's also important for the company to prepare itself for the future, right? So that was like one of the biggest uh, challenges that we faced yeah, initially. And how has the response been now? So, so far, uh, we've been in operation for about 22 months um, as a business, and the whole idea was for us to validate our concept, right? Um, before looking at big investments or creating a bigger budget uh, for our, our business project, we wanted to start small, we wanted to experiment, and uh, that's the whole concept of design thinking also comes into play where we speak to multiple different customers, we would speak to uh, different startups and different entrepreneurs or ambitious entrepreneurs in that space uh, to understand what is it that they expect from the manufacturer. Um, and because, because you no, know, I think MA is being based out of here in Sri Lanka, uh, we sometimes don't really quite know what's really going on in the, in the outside world. So it's super important for us to understand the customer dynamics, understand uh, the thinking of the entrepreneurs uh, in that space. So it's been, uh, we've been working on this for almost two years now. Um, of course, there were quite a few challenges that we had to face along the way. Um, but the main thing is to capture the learnings and fine tune our business model and um, sort of see what is the best way that we can uh, move forward. So you mentioned design thinking um, and, and its importance to run back it. What exactly, how would exactly would you define design? Even though we, we, even though we may not have the full answers at the moment, but it is a constant uh, journey where we still need to build uh, the conviction again, still, right? Um, especially from the, from the senior management, the senior leadership and senior management so it's constantly um, something that we, we, we continue to work on um, as well. But it's, it's not going to be an overnight fix uh, for sure. Yeah. You also mentioned customization, small MOQs. Um, do you think 
our traditional bigger, larger retail brands could benefit from this kind of learning that MAS has? Um, do you also see that see these brands moving towards that direction as well? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, definitely. I think we see that even larger traditional established brands are also looking for small order quantities as well. Um, and that is going to be the trend. Um, because now we have digital, we have e-commerce, we have online ordering, and we also need to understand what is the current generation of people are looking for, right? And how do they, what is their customer behavior, right? How do they really uh, make decisions, you know, because uh, everything is accessible to smartphones and technology and all these other devices. Um, so I think now we are seeing that uh, larger brands are also rethinking about how they should position their um, digital and e-commerce strategy to, you know, to, to, to best serve their existing customer, the existing uh, consumer, uh, um, consumer landscape, right? But also, this is something that the MAs would, would have to um, figure out the, the, the manufacturing and operating model um, to see like, how best we can serve the large established brands, but also the smaller digital e-commerce brands as well. And how do you think the consumer is changing um, in the past couple of maybe the decade? And do you see a difference in that trend after COVID as well? I think uh, we have seen that COVID, um, the, I mean, I would say that there's a reason why COVID happened, right? And um, um, it, there, there, has to be, there has to be some sort of underlying um, reasons, right? Uh, Kuna, you mentioned uh, catering to uh, different consumer needs. How do you think those needs have evolved over the couple of years? Has it evolved? further uh, after the, during the COVID pandemic as well? I think, um, I think we have seen that COVID has, um, has accelerated certain uh, activities and certain initiatives, especially on the digital space. And uh, what we have done is we have also seen that there are many digital tools that are out there that can actually, uh, or, and certain other companies out there that we see that there's a value addition and there's a, there's a benefit for us, for them to help us understand how we can speed up or automate certain processes. Um, so in terms of the consumer dynamics, um, I think we have seen that this current generation, um, it's, it's evolving at a, at, a, at, a, uh, at a speed, you know, at a rapid pace. In terms of the season, I think in terms of the season of uh, when the product is planned to sell, right? So I think um, this is something that uh, the manufacturer would need to um, figure out a model of supporting smaller order quantities and be quick enough to respond to demand, right? In order to support the consumer, uh, market, in order to uh, respond and adapt to the consumer changes. So um, personally, I feel sustainability is quite important, but it's also now a very common buzzword, more so I feel during the pandemic as well. How do you feel that playing into uh, your area of work? Is Runway Kit focusing on that sort of areas as well? Uh, in terms of... Uh, sustainability right, and... Okay. Yeah? Right. Um, so we've seen that sustainability is also like one of the biggest initiatives that has... Um, accelerated over the last two, three years. And I think that's also in response to the current generation of consumers, because people are looking for um, how to be uh, you know, conscious about the environment, uh, conscious about uh, the way that fashion is evolving, conscious about the clothing that they're wearing, right? Uh, people are also conscious about the uh, ethical standards and good working conditions at the, at the, at the shop floor. Right. And I think we're also seeing that eventually at some point we will see a better transparency um, in terms of how people would want to find out how the yarn is being produced, how is the raw material being produced, um, you know, how much of water was used, um, how much of uh, carbon dioxide that was emitted into the atmosphere. Um, and I think, you know, there would be some, level, some levels of 
measurements that will be taken into account in this whole concept of sustainability. And uh, that is something that um, MAS is constantly uh, looking uh, into that space. So if um, one of your customers on Runway Kit wanted to do a very sustainable product or sustainability focused product, how, how would you support them? Do you have any tools that, could, that they could use? So, uh, so on our first package, on the Ready Styles package, we also offer sustainable and non-sustainable fabrics as well, right? So there are some specifications on what it means to produce a sustainable fabric, right? It comes with a different sort of uh, production process that um, comes into producing this fabric. Um, different composition and I think yeah, there's a different costing as well, right? That's, that's from a, that's from a, we, 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 can, we can, we also offer sustainable trims and sustainable accessories as well on the platform. Um, and if the customers also would like to offer sustainable solutions, then we also get our teams who uh, are in close contact with the suppliers to see whether they also offer sustainable uh, raw materials, right? That's one aspect of it. The second aspect is um, the custom styles package, which we offer virtual prototyping. And from, for us, the, the biggest thing is, if you look at the traditional um, process of sample development, there would be about five to six rounds of producing one particular style, right? Because our merchants will produce one style and send it to the customers. Um, and they would come back to us with some comments, whether there's fit changes or measurement changes or whatever. And then we produce the second, second sample, send it to them, and they try with the fit model and then send it back to us with uh, some changes. So um, we hope that with the introduction of virtual prototyping, that would actually eliminate um, the multiple rounds of fit samples, right? So we introduced two rounds of virtual prototyping and we use uh, a software called Browseware, uh, Browseware technology, right? That converts the 2D patterns into 3D, right? So it kind of like creates the whole 3D concept on that tool. And uh, we sent that to the customers for feedback, right? So, uh, so we hope to come towards a state of 85 to 90% accuracy. Uh, based on the feedback. And then we will be in a position to produce only one sample for them, right? So that's, uh, that's a bit of a drastic um, change in that whole sample development. Is that where you see Runway Kids North Star? Is that what it's going to be ultimately? Uh, number one is how do we create the best possible user experience for the customers, for the entrepreneurs to pick and select what would be the most suitable fabrics, suitable um, uh, options that we provide them. Um, but also the second important piece is, uh, we also need to educate our manufacturing guides, right? We also really need to um, provide some insights uh, because those are the guys who may not have access to understand what's going on out there in the marketplace, right? So we really need to understand what are the challenges that they, that they are dealing with um, with the startup brand. If I divert the conversation a little bit, what actually inspires you to kind of keep chipping at it, keep working at it um, uh, at MS? Uh, so for me, since I've been in this space uh, for quite some time um, and having spent um, quite a bit of time at the factory floor as well. Um, my, my hope and uh, my ambition is for MAs to figure out the most uh, scalable and commercialized and profitable business and operating model to support the emerging brands that are coming, that are coming out because um, we are going to see um, more and more emerging brands in the next uh, five, seven years. And I think that whole trend will continue. Um, it's not going to stop, right? So it's also part of my responsibility to um, constantly be in touch with the senior leadership, the senior management, and the factory management as well. Um, 
to see like what is the best way for us to service uh, the emerging uh, emerging brands what are the current asks from emerging brands that you're seeing i think with our generation we're seeing that people want things uh, instant you know here and now so as a manufacturer sometimes we have a lot of processes and a lot of uh, practices in place so it, it it requires a bit of a shake up for these manufacturers to figure out how do we respond uh, to them quickly um so kuna what contributions have you made in your uh, corporate life that you are most proud of using my set of experiences that i've gained over the years and i saw that there was a niche i saw that there was a gap uh, that image was facing and um, that was also to support the emerging brands and startups because i understood that there were some pain points and challenges that we were facing as a manufacturer and of course with my personal experience with this uh, with this um, college startup that uh, that we spoke about um and i felt that uh, this was the space that nobody else was working on so i decided to put my hand up and uh, and you know decided to take the leadership um in this space and uh, i was you know quite fortunate to be working with uh, jahan with alif um and and he provided me with the right team the right resources to go out there and execute on this uh, business project and what would you say some of the learnings that you've gathered in your career or maybe in your academic life that has really helped you on this journey something that you can really relate to uh, you know uh so so one of the um, one of the biggest uh, things that i realized is how to create an impact um how do you sort of be in a comfortable position that you feel uh, confident it's about like you know building the confidence Uh, did, I, did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah, you did. And also, what inspires you to kind of keep uh, going and keep chipping at it? I try to understand uh, what is the need, and you got to figure out your your own answers along the way. But in order for you to develop the answers, you need to be in a position to ask the right, good quality questions, right? That will really help you to understand. uh better so i think it's the whole concept of creative thinking and just thinking out of the box and i realized that working at emirates sometimes uh, that's one of the one of the biggest things that we struggle with um, as a company is when engaging with people people expect um people expect uh, instruction or they expect you to come up with an answer right because um that's also something that as a leader you need to be able to uh, figure out what's the best solution or best recommendations and then you provide direction you provide uh, instruction uh, to the people that you work with and yeah um for someone who's like you wants to take up a new challenge put their hand up and say you know i want to take this on what would you say if you were going to mentor them i would encourage them I, i would encourage them to take the risk um and that's the whole concept of entrepreneurship right um if you're passionate about the idea if you have expressed that passion for the product you understand that there's a need there is uh, a gap that needs to be filled and you understand the the technical aspects of the product um i would i would um and courage uh, that person to take the to, 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 to take the leap interesting that you say that so um especially when you're leading a a, a novel product or an innovation um you're bound to hear a lot of noise you're bound to take a lot of pivots how do you keep your team motivated um in an environment like that um it's a very good question um so 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 one of the things that we used to do before before covid hit um what's that if we once in once a month or once in two months um i also realized that uh, we need to continue the bond and keep the team going um and i realized that in order to strengthen the relationships with your team and with your peers and your colleagues you can't do that at the workplace alone right it's not just like a typical 9 to 5 job right 
you need to be able to carve out some spades and um, after work, just go out for a drink, take them out for dinner, um, or, you know, catch up with them one-on-ones, you know, over coffee or something. Um, and that's also a really good way for, for you to kind of like strengthen that relationship uh, with the teams. And for me, the biggest thing is make sure that I would make sure to get the factory guys involved as well as part of that whole process. Because it's really important to get their input. And we want to make sure that we're, not, we're just not sitting at offices at the center and making all the decisions. So we need to get the factories buying. So in order for us to build the relationships with the factory, factory teams, we also need to take care of them, take them out and make them feel as part of one team. Um, so um, at innovation, we're used to talking a lot about the successes because when the successes come, they're big. But it's the failures that really kind of teach us certain things that helps us in our journey. Are there any failures that you want to discuss that you in, that inspired you to you know do things differently? I think the most uh, the most recent example that I think that I can think of failure is by working on this project itself, right? Because with Ranvi Kid, just like what I mentioned before. There are no answers. Uh, there, there's a lot of unknowns. There's a lot of uh, uncertainties that we are stepping into. So we have tried so many different things. We have probably experimented with about, I would say maybe about 25 to 30, 35 different things, right? But what we have done is we have realized that um, not all 30, 35 things are expected to work. So we would try an initiative or an experiment in a small scale and um, try that out for two, three months. And then at the end of that time frame, you would try to understand the conclusions, right? try to understand the findings and results. And then you make a decision to see whether that initiative is working or not, yeah. right? Whether it's to do with the marketing campaigns or it's to do with uh, making some, uh, some tweaks on the platform or the system, right? working on a few experiments um, at, at, the, at the factory level. So the, so the idea is for us to realize as quickly and as early on, when to make the decision and say, okay, yeah, that's, that, that's, that's not working. So we should stop that and let's try something else. Um, so risks associated with something new is quite high. How do you try and de-risk or how do you minimize the risk? How can you do that? Try to understand the scope, try to understand uh, what is the purpose of um, going about with this initiative. Try to understand what's the feasibility, like what's, uh, try to ask yourself the question if it's, if it's worth um, pursuing that initiative. And try to do your um, due diligence, you know, make sure that you conduct a full uh, due diligence of what is it that you want to go out, what is it that you want to go for. And make sure that uh, when, you're, when you're done with that experiment, try to see what is it that you want to get out of it, right? And what is it that you try to validate, right? Once, you, once you've done that comprehensive study, then you should be in a better position where I, I should be equipped uh, with having 60% of the information for me to make a decision and say, okay, let's, let's go and uh, try this out, right? So I guess that's probably the best way that I would go about in minimizing the risk. And um, in your career, how do you try to stay relevant um, as, as things kind of move on and the, your ecosystems and the environments change? How do you do that? Sometimes I would connect with uh, some of the designers uh, in the industry, in our industry, just to try to understand um, what are the trends that the designers are seeing out there. Because I feel that when you connect with emergence or um, sample development, uh, emergence and production, some of those people are just focusing on the job at hand. But the designers are the ones who are out there, right? So I try to connect with them. I try to do some reading. I try to follow what's going on in the fashion and in fashion industry uh, world. And look at what are the other startups out there, what are the other different entrepreneurs, different companies doing out there. Um, moving on to the apparel sector, um, 
what do you think is an unexplored area or a big area that MAS can go after maybe in the next 10 years? I think there's quite a lot that MAS is uh, already doing, right? If you look at the whole innovation ecosystem, um, we're working on different projects. Um, and that's what we've been doing in the last seven to eight years. I don't think there's like one particular answer that I can pinpoint there, but but definitely the concept of apparel, clothing, fashion would evolve over a period of time. Um, yeah, it's. And if you move away from apparel, what other industry do you think that requires like a lot of innovation um, that you would like to see more innovation in? Is it uh, asking beyond apparel? Uh, Sorry? Is it beyond a parallel? Uh, beyond a parallel, yes. Parallel. The industry, they would like to see in innovation. Um, I would say agriculture and farming, right? Um, I know that's a bit uh, conventional, but um, when I think about agriculture and farming, I sometimes think that it's it's actually a space that I feel that uh, not many of us has looked into. Um, and so they, 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 it's a conventional, traditional way of uh, going about with how things were done because food and the ingredients are one of the basic, basic, uh, ba basic essentials for, for all of us, right? But I really do think that it's going to change big time in the next 25 to 30, 50 years. So, I'm not too sure that I have seen much of what's, what is happening in the innovation aspect of agriculture and uh, farming. And I, that's something that I would probably, um, and perhaps there might be, uh, that I may not be aware of, but um, that's, I mean, maybe for Sri Lanka, maybe that's something that uh, the country can look into uh, that space, because there's a huge opportunity um, in that space, yeah. And um, again, outside of apparel, if there is one problem or tech challenge out there that you would like to solve, and assuming you have no barriers to it, um, that you have an open canvas to it, is there a particular tech challenge or, or a, a problem in general that you would like to see uh, so solved or sorted? I was thinking of this crazy idea where um, now we're talking about Uber Eats, right? We're talking about um, selecting uh, you know from the menu for what you want right the, the kind of cuisine or the food food that you want and uh, someone comes in a bike and delivers the food right just thinking like what if there would be a concept where we would directly connect um, supermarkets supermarkets that produce fresh ingredients right because we're trying to encourage more people to cook at, at home as opposed to ordering food from out all the time right um so I'll maybe dive into a little bit more about Kunal Amlin. So I was browsing through your LinkedIn uh, page and there was um, a term cochlear evangelist. What does that mean to you, Kunal? So, um, so uh, for me personally, I'm actually a hard of hearing and uh, I wear cochlear implants on both ears. Um, and I was actually born profoundly deaf since birth, right? Uh, which means that without those implants, then I'm, uh, I would, would hear nothing, right? And uh, I have, you know, been quite passionate about the space uh, where I feel that there's a lot that I can contribute. There's a lot that I can give back to the society. And uh, I uh, would like to sort of provide a source of inspiration for uh, young parents, um, young adults, and small kids as well, um, kids who are hard of hearing. Um, and because I feel that um, this is a space that, uh, that's also closer to my heart and closer to my family's heart as well. And um, I feel that um, that's also something that I would like to um, give back to the communities, share my, my, my experiences. Um, how, did I, how did I manage to school? Um, here in Sri Lanka, and uh, my the, at, at the time that I spent in Boston, when I was in Boston for six years, it was a huge, um, huge uh, shock for me, because I was also in my protective bubble here in Sri Lanka, right? And then um, 
It's a different education system, a different set of friends, different um, set of people that you are connecting with and understanding different accents. <laughs> because uh, when you connect people from different parts of the world and to build relationships with people, you would also need to understand um, uh, you know, their, way, their ways of talking. And what does two uh, inclusivity kind of look like to you? What does that mean to you? Uh, so for me, when I think about inclusivity, I think about uh, embracing yourself and being accept accepting for who you are as a person, right? Because um, when I was a small kid, like when I was much younger, um, I used to always try to fit in to the society. You know, like when you when you when you're in school, right? You would want to make sure that you hang out with um, with friends and you want to be part of the same group. Because you want to be cool, like you want to, um, you know, you, you, you would like them to like you, right? And you would want to be part of, uh, part of the group. So I would, back in the day, I would try really hard to fit in. But then I realized over a period of time that it's not just like, uh, that you shouldn't worry too much about fitting in, but rather just focus on what really makes you happy. Um, and really sort of... Um, Embracing yourself and accepting yourself for who you are uh, as a person. Uh, that's kind of like my definition for true inclusivity. Yeah. And if you um, look at Kunal Amini outside of work, what exactly are you really proud of, um, of on, about things that you have kind of achieved or done? Um, so the most, uh, I would say the most recent uh, it's recent uh, achievement that I've done is I uh, took part in the uh, 21 kilometer half marathon about two months ago, um, which I, I was training myself for seven to eight weeks. And um, I did a couple of um, exercises. And that was also something that I've been really, really wanted to do over the last two years because um, because when I came back to Sri Lanka in 2015, I took part in the Kalambo Marathon, which usually takes place in October, yeah. right? And I would sign up for 10 kilometers, yeah. right? So for three years, I've done 10 kilometers. And I, my, my ambition, my goal was to, was to do the 21 kilometers half marathon. And so back in 2019, I wanted to sign up for the half marathon. But then obviously we were, Obviously, we had the Easter Sunday attacks that happened, so uh, that was cancelled. And last year, obviously, with COVID, that didn't happen. So I'm part of the running running group, which uh, when you get ambitious, um, um, aspirational people who really strive to complete uh, half marathons or full marathons. Um, so yeah, I, I would say that was like um, my, my recent uh, biggest achievement. And what would the, the next 10 years for, look like for you, um, work-wise and men, then maybe um, achievement-wise, personal or professional? Mm, that's actually quite big. Yeah. Um, I <laughs> haven't um, thought too far ahead yeah. um, because obviously we're just focusing on the short and medium term, uh, how do we respond to COVID? Uh, how do we ensure that we are in a better position as we go through COVID? How do we stay connected with our people? How do we come out of the crisis, right? Um, I guess for me, the biggest thing is to maintain your health and well-being. You know, that's something that, I, that would be my first priority is to focus on that. Uh, so Kunal, thank you so very much for joining us on this podcast today uh, for a truly interesting conversation. Um, wish you all the very best with Runway Kit and for, their ne for your next couple of half marathons as well. And hopefully we'll see you in your Ironman soon. Thank you so much for the time. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Take care.